I am sorry to be obliged to refuse to see you. I have given the fullest and most anxious consideration to the representations which have been made to me to mitigate the sentence passed on Kelly, and I deeply regret that I come to no other decision than that which has been conveyed to you, and it must be regarded as final. I am McKenna, Home Secretary. It was Tuesday evening, the 16th of December 1913, and the streets of Oldham, in the northwest of England, had an air of menace. There was a growing fury and frustration at the news that had just reached them from the Home Secretary's office, and as a large crowd congregated outside the family home of a young man with less than 12 hours to live, the anger reached fever pitch. Many stood in tears, while the mother of the condemned man reeled in a state of total collapse, moaning incoherently that her son was being treated unfairly. As realisation set in that the Home Secretary's decision was final and the law was going to take its course, the mob marched towards the town hall, smashing windows and loudly venting their wrath at the Home Secretary. More people joined, many the worse for drink, and police were put on full alert. As the pubs emptied, the crowd swelled, many shouting and gesturing, rescue him and no work tomorrow, as they continued to throw missiles and verbally abuse the police. Not content with damaging shop doors and windows, they began to attack trams and surrounded Werner's police station, where windows were smashed and officers had to barricade themselves inside for their own protection. It was as midnight approached that the decision was made to march on Manchester's strange ways prison. With the mob still growing by the minute and bricks hurled through windows along the route, word was sent ahead and police reinforcements from all parts of Lancashire hurried to give assistance. Mounted police were used to drive them back as armed with sticks, crowbars and a variety of shovels and spades, the angry mob reached the end of Southall Street opposite the prison gates. An angry standoff commenced as dawn broke over the grim Victorian jail with a line of police constables stopping them from reaching the prison gate. As the clock ticked towards eight o'clock, inside the jail the prisoner prayed fervently in the condemned cell. On the previous afternoon he had a painful last visit from his older sister Lilla but he remained composed in the cell and spent a peaceful night. As the hour struck, hangman John Ellis and assistant George Brown entered the condemned cell, and after thanking the warders for their kindness and shaking hands with the governor, the prisoner walked bravely onto the trapdoors and seconds later paid the full penalty for a brutal crime. So what had caused such a furore? Daniel Wright Birdsley ran a profitable book selling and stationery business on Oldham's bustling Yorkshire Street. Having thrown himself fully into the business, he found himself at 54 years of age as a confirmed bachelor, sharing his home with his brother and sister-in-law on Edgerton Street, close to his lock-up premises. He employed a staff of three, two women, Annie Leach and Clara Hall, and the 17-year-old Edward Wilde Hilton, who worked as a packer and errand boy. Hilton had only been employed at the shop for a few weeks, having recently returned to his native Oldham after spending time in a special school in Canada for children with learning difficulties. His work was soon found to be unsatisfactory, and on Saturday the 26th of July, Birdsley decided he was going to have to let him go. He told Hilton the news in the morning, and the young man pleaded for a second chance and promised to shape up. Birdsley said he would think about it, but having watched him go about his duties that afternoon, he decided he was going to have to let him go. In the early hours of the following morning, James Greaves, one of the Yorkshire Street Watch, a group of night watchmen and caretakers privately employed by the owners of lock-up shops in the area to keep a check on their premises, noted the back door of Bursley's shop was ajar. It had been closed when he did his rounds after midnight and shining his lantern inside, he saw the body of a man lying on the packing room floor. He hurried to the local police station and Inspector Johnson accompanied him back and found Daniel Bursley lying face down in a pool of blood. A doctor was summoned who confirmed the man was dead and it was clear he had suffered a fearful beating. His face was swollen and discoloured and there were streaks of blood on the floor and walls. Beside the body was a metal dumbbell and a wooden Indian club, both of which were covered in blood. Shortly after dawn that Sunday morning, detectives spoke to both female employees at the bookstore. They each confirmed they had left Bursley working in the upstairs office at around 10.30 last night. Hilton had helped secure the shutters on the front of the shop and he had left shortly before them at around 10pm. Clara Hall also mentioned a few things that suggested a possible motive. She told officers that earlier on the previous afternoon she had gone to a local jeweller to collect half a dozen sovereign rings so that Birdsley could choose one without having to leave the premises. 
She also mentioned that she was present when her boss had told Hilton his employment was being terminated and that the rings had been on the desk when that conversation took place. Hilton was spoken to at his home on Manchester Street later that morning. He seemed shocked and upset when told the tragic news and he was asked for his movements after he had finished work. Avoiding eye contact, Hilton said he had met his friend Ernie outside the shop and that they had gone to the fur at Hollingwood. He said he had returned home shortly after midnight and gone straight to bed. Johnson asked where he could find Ernie and Hilton said he didn't know his proper name nor where he lived. As Johnson spoke to Hilton, a constable went upstairs and noticed on the bedroom floor items of clothing clearly covered in blood. Hilton was asked to show what he had been wearing. The detective already knew, having checked with the two women at work, and Hilton pointed to the blood-stained trousers and shirt on the floor. Satisfied that he was involved in the crime, Hilton was placed under arrest and removed to the police station situated at the local town hall. Ernie was soon found to be Ernest Edward Kelly, a 20-year-old piecer who worked at Platt Brothers, a local mill, and who lived on nearby Ward Street. Detectives went to speak to Kelly, who, after making initial denial, soon admitted he had struck Birdsley twice with a wooden club, but the man was alive when he left the shop. He took officers into the backyard at the house and showed them where he had stashed a quantity of money and four sovereign rings he had taken from the office. Kelly was taken to the police station via Hilton's house and with the two youngsters face to face, each blamed the other for carrying out the fatal blows. Hilton took the officers outside and pointed out where he had hidden his share of the spoils. On the following day, an inquest was held which found that Daniel Birdsley had died after being struck several times about the head by a blunt instrument and that either or both weapons found beside the body could have made the wounds. The short hearing ended with both men being remanded to stand trial at the Winter Assizes. Mr Justice Avery presided over the trial at Manchester Assizes which opened on Monday the 24th of November 1913 and the defence failed at the outset to have the two men tried separately. Mr Gordon Hewitt KC, a Manchester MP, led for the Crown and outlined the prosecution's case that both men were concerned in the robbery of the bookstore and that during the furtherance of theft they committed a brutal murder. Hilton was the first to take the stand. He said that he had arranged to meet Kelly after work and they attended to go to the Hollywood Fair. They, however, had a problem in that neither had any money, and when Hilton told his friend he had been sacked from his job, he said that Kelly had suggested they commit robbery. Hilton agreed and said they should wait until his former boss had locked up, but it was Kelly who suggested they carry out the robbery while Bursley was on the premises, suggesting it would be easier to gain entry if they could persuade him to open up, rather than have to resort to breaking in. While they debated what to do, Hilton said Kelly disappeared for ten minutes and his defence claimed he had used his time to go and collect the wooden Indian club he kept in his yard. Hilton said they decided to wait until Birdsley went home before they would commit the crime and they both hid in the back while they waited for the two female assistants to leave. When Kelly went into the dock, his testimony pretty much matched that of Hilton's up to this point. It was as they waited for Birdsley to leave that Hilton's version of events differed from Kelly's. Hilton said he called at the shop and knocked on the door. Birdsley answered and asked him what he wanted. Hilton said he had come to collect his apron and clearly annoyed at the disturbance at such a late hour he told him to hurry up, collect it and go. Hilton then said he went into the back room to collect the apron and he heard a cry. Spinning round he saw Kelly standing over the unconscious man holding the bloodstained club. Aghast, Hilton shrieked, Oh no, God will punish us for this, claiming it was the first time he had seen the club. Kelly asked where the safe was and told it was in the office upstairs they both hurried up and attempted to force it open. It was at this point that they heard moans and stumbling from downstairs, as Bursley recovered from the blow and was attempting to get to his feet. Hilton said he went downstairs intending to help, trying to revive the victim with a glass of water. He said he shouted for Kelly to help him and the older youth came downstairs. Kelly walked over to the stricken bookseller, but instead of offering assistance, had picked up the wooden club and brought it down with great force onto his head. As Bursley struggled, Kelly was laced with a forced handkerchief into his mouth to stifle the moans. Leaving him for dead, they rifled his pockets, taking the money from his wallet and a bunch of keys that they used in vain to open the safe. They had then decided to take just a tray of rings off the desk and the contents of the wallet and flee. Under cross-examination, Hilton denied at any time he had struck any of the blows, blaming that entirely on his accomplice in the dock. Kelly's version of events differed in many parts. He agreed they had arranged to meet after Hilton finished work, but it was Hilton who suggested they carry out the robbery in revenge for having been dismissed. Kelly said that Hilton had suggested he go fetch the wooden club in case they needed a weapon to scare him into handing over the money. 
He said that as they waited for the women to leave work, Hilton had passed him a handkerchief which he suggested he used to cover his face, while he did the same thing. Kelly told then how Hilton had told him to take off his shoes and they crept quietly into the shop. Swap jackets with me, he added, telling Kelly to be sure to hit him hard with the club. Asked why they couldn't carry out the robbery without resorting to violence, Hilton had told him they would need to get the keys from his pocket and they would need to knock him out to do that. Kelly said that they were disturbed by Bursley as they rummaged around the packing room, whereupon Hilton had pulled out his replica gun and told him to stick him up. Bursley panicked and tried to flee, making for the back door, when he tripped and fell to the ground. At this point, Kelly admitted he had struck the bookseller, but that was just to quieten him down. As he was trying to make him comfortable, Hilton took the club from him and struck him several times about the head before emptying his pockets. He had then picked up a tray of rings that had been on Birdsley's desk. Having made a failed attempt to open the safe, they slipped out the back door, divided up the spoils and went their separate ways home. Summing up the case, Mr Justice Avery told the jury that it didn't matter who had struck the fatal blows if both youths had been present when the blows were struck. If both were present on a joint venture, then both were equally guilty. After a six and a half hour trial, the jury needed just 15 minutes to return a guilty verdict, adding a recommendation for mercy on account of their youth. With a black cap draped upon his wig, Mr Justice Avery sentenced both men to death by hanging. In his report, the judge recorded that he did not concur with the recommendations for mercy and neither prisoner chose to appeal. Hilton had recently turned 18 and was therefore liable to face a death penalty but it was soon announced that as he had been under the age of 18 at the time of the murder, his sentence was being commuted to life imprisonment. This caused a great deal of outrage amongst the folk of Oldham, for despite the brutal savagery of the attack, many believed it was Hilton who was the more guilty, and that if anyone should be spurred, it should be Kelly. Numerous petitions were gathered, with some collecting many thousand signatures. The protesting went on as the date of execution drew nearer. Members of Parliament were lobbied and letters were sent to Queen Mary, including one from Kelly's mother, who described her son as the less guilty of the two. Kelly's representatives also produced evidence that the condemned man was immature, with a mental age of 14, and they showed a photograph taken just before the murder in which they posed childlike, dressed as cowboys. It was all to no avail. So Ernie Kelly went bravely to the gallows. There was no doubt he was guilty as charged as the law stood, and as it has been shown many years later with Derrick Bentley, that in cases where two men go out to commit a crime, even if one carries no active part in any assault, they are both deemed equally guilty. The question here wasn't so much as was justice done, but more like why wasn't it dished out in equal measure. In Oldham, shortly after the execution, a mourning card was produced that stated, in loving memory of Ernest Kelly, who was executed at Strangeways Prison, Manchester, on December the 17th, 1913, notwithstanding the protest of over 50,000 citizens of Oldham. Newspapers of the day noted that the two youths were influenced by watching cowboy films at the cinema, and that Hilton sometimes carried a replica cowboy pistol. This media influence has long featured in murder cases. Back in 1889, two youths were hanged at Maidstone, and the court were told that they were impressed and swayed by reading Penny Dreadful comics. In the 1950s and early 60s, several of those convicted were said to have been influenced by Teddy Boy gang culture and to have watched violent Kosh Boy crime movies. And even more recently, the two youngsters convicted of the murder of James Bolger in the early 90s were thought to have been fascinated by watching adult horror movies. Edward Wilde Hilton was released from Maidstone Jail on the 9th of September 1933, having served almost 20 years for his part in the murder that almost caused a riot. He had spent time in prison learning a trade as a painter and also to play a musical instrument and had even played the euphonium in the prison band. He died in Southend on Sea Essex in 1969, having survived his partner in crime by 56 years. My name is Steve Fielding. Thank you for watching and listening to another episode of Tales from the Hangman's Record. Please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel the Hangman's Record, and also check out the website thehangmansrecord.com where you can find out more about my books and order copies of The Hangman's Record at a special subscriber price. Please use the comments below to discuss this case and for suggestions for any other episodes in the Tales from the Hangman's Record series. <laughs>